so much. How's everyone doing? Good. Melanie's done a lot of the hard work that I um, was going to do, which is great because we've all started warm. Um, I like this configuration. We're going to keep this configuration because we are going to be having more of a conversation today than a presentation. Okay. Um, in South Africa, we are dying to have conversations. And we're having them all the time. We're just having them with the people who look like us and who agree with us, right? So we find that we, it's called an echo chamber, right? You shout, hello, 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 and we hear our own voice back, and it just kind of reinforces our own beliefs and our own systems. And I really relish in the opportunity to kind of bust that echo chamber here a little bit today, um, here to challenge some of our thinking, here to engage meaningfully, which is a really scary thing to do, right? It's a really frightening thing to do, but... I can promise you now that it's going to be really meaningful. Okay, and you can trust me on this process. So I've been asked to come and speak on embracing diversity. And the first thing I always ask is, what is this white boy doing here talking about diversity and inclusion? Anyone have any thoughts about that? My whiteness and my masculinity as it relates to me speaking about diversity and inclusion. What could he possibly know? Also, he has a nose ring, you know. <laughs> any thoughts? Come. Any thoughts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why maybe some people would think, what can a white person tell me about diversity? Mm. Yeah? And, and even if you look at corporates, mm. if they talk about diversity, they talk about you know, how do we promote certain people mm. in an organization. So and diversity for me is much more than that. What is it? It is our background. Yeah. And, and you guys did, I wasn't, I wasn't able to share that because I came from another session. Yeah. But you guys talk about um, your different life experiences. Right. Um, so your life experiences, it's about your qualifications, your way of thinking. Yeah. It is who you are. Yeah. Your religion. Yeah. All of those things in our constitution. All those things our constitution speak about. Yeah. Gender. That makes us different. Absolutely. Um, and when, of course, uh, the color of your skin is but one thing. Yeah. I kind of see it as like a, a queue, let's use Woolworths, given my school. It's kind of a queue at Woolworths, right? So race is in the front of the queue, and then we kind of have gender, and then we kind of have sexuality, and then disability, and then language, and we are kind of just waiting to deal with all of these things. But all of these things are important, and race is important to chat about, okay? It is important, it is pressing, it is front of mind, but what I'd like to bring into the space here today is that we can actually deal with all of them because it's not about dealing with race. It's actually about learning the skills of how we engage diversity, right? That's my opinion. And we're going to chat a little bit about it today. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys to chat with me. I'm going to ask you guys to put up your hand and challenge me and ask me questions and really engage with me. We only have 45 minutes today and I wish we had three days because this topic deserves three days. But I have 45 minutes. I speak quite quickly. Okay, so if it's even too fast, be like, Roy, slow down, we can have an engagement. Let's jump all the way in. Okay, so my name is Roy Glackman. I'm from Cohesion Collective. Cohesion Collective is a diversity and inclusions consulting and implementation firm. Essentially what we do is we have a very strong presence in the school space within Johannesburg as well as in corporates and we come in and we kind of do undiversity training or rather diversity untraining, right? Because the way that it's been done has become stale, it's become old. I mean, I've I don't like to call myself this, but I have been called this a, a conference junkie. I've been to like eight conferences this year. Um, and a lot of them spoke about the millennials this and the millennials that. I'm sure you guys have been on a hundred of these conversations. Not once have I seen a conversation about millennials being run by a millennial, right? Not once. So I hope to also give a bit of insight on that because I actually am a millennial, which is wonderful. But really what I'm trying to say is that the approach that Cohesion Collected that we take is something to actually have honest conversations and to engage meaningfully. So let's start. What is diversity? So differences, right? Or as Melanie said, uniqueness. But let's stick with diversity. So we've already had a contribution that it is background. What else contributes or adds to diversity? Just shout them out. Come, we know these things, yeah? Experience, yeah? Hey? Age, good. I love that one. Who said age? Yeah, got you. Yes, what else? Community, what do you mean by that? Well, in different communities, you might have different Yeah. What else? Culture, Culture good, yeah? Uh, Race, good. Gender, excellent. Religion, language, sexual orientation. Hey? Body type. Body type, yeah. 
we're going to say appearance, you know, because there's, there's something called pretty privilege which we need to deal with in this world, right? Like Melanie said, right? Yeah. When you shared your thing, I'm like, yeah, pretty privilege. What else? Appearance. So we have background, experience, age, community, culture, race, gender, religion, language, sexual orientation, appearance. Marital status. Marital status thank you. Pregnancy. Education. Education. What about nationality? What about geography? What about culture? We've got, actually. What about sex? Yes or no? We have gender. We have got gender. Oh, okay. Let's take a pause. Let's pause. Let's pause. Let's pause. Are sex and gender the same thing? No. Someone tell me the difference. So you, you, you very serious about this. Yeah. Guys, we are going to have one conversation. Okay? One. Yeah. I always get it the wrong way around. It's okay. One, we can try. The one, the one I know is a creation of us as a humankind. The other one is how we born. So which one do you think? Just try. Think, what does it matter? I, I, I think this, the, if I'm correct, you, the, the gender one is the one that um, we have created. Good. Right. Excellent. Winning. Winning answer. You got it. I could feel the anxiety. <laughs> and I was like, just give it a shot. <laughs> so sex is our biology, what we are born with, our parts, our bits, okay? Gender is our psychology, how we identify, okay? Sex and gender are two completely different diversity dimensions. We have been taught to think that sex and gender are the same thing. They are not. They have never been. Okay? So sex and gender are two completely different things. So we've got all this array of diversity, right? All these things that make us different, that contribute to our identity. And they're all incredibly, incredibly important. Quick question for everyone. Why is it important? Why? Why is diversity important? Okay? Makes life interesting? Can we also agree that it makes life difficult? Okay, because to think that diversity is this wonderful melting pot of nations, it's actually incredibly difficult. What else? Why is it important that we even talk about diversity, that we embrace diversity? To take all the talents we have. To take all the talents and use, utilize all the talents that we have, right? Can we all buy into that? To celebrate diversity. Why is that important? Because it's in our faces, so we kind of face it that we now have to deal with it. We haven't dealt with it, okay. Ah, uh, what else? Why is it important? So people can be treated fairly. So people can be treated fairly at the back. You have to understand that someone else might not see something the same as you because of Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So. Pink and lime green. Pink and lime green. So we can all agree. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. What's the opposite of diversity? What is the opposite of diversity? So what's the opposite of difference? Sameness. Uniformity. Uniformity. Uh, right. Homogeneity. The same. So exactly. So we all, this is what we battle every day because this is what we have. Shh, 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 shh. Same uniform, same way of thinking, same thought process, same. Mm. So that we can have life easier for <laughs> us instead of challenging. And we can see this is a rebel. We can even see the way we, 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 we present ourselves. I love it. But if we just kind of pause at this point, there's some, there's some truth in this. In that we are essentially, in our schooling system, creating linear thinking. Right? I actually, I'm, I do a lot of work in the school spaces and there's a young woman from Kingsmead, which is a private school in Johannesburg, who's connected, on me, uh, connected with me after we ran a session. We've just been engaging emails back and forth and it's been a wonderful experience because that's, that's what I like to do as well as engage with our youth. And she said to me today, actually in an email on the, uh, today on the Uber here, she was like, you know what, Roy, my parents are making me do law. Right? And all we taught at the school is that you finish school, you get a degree, you go study accounting law, and that's it. And she's feeling completely trapped. Okay, but that's a bit of a side note. We're not really taking diversity into account. But here's the but, and this is what we're going to talk about today. Diversity is difficult. To think that diversity is this wonderful thing that's going to liberate us and it's going to innovate and all this bullshit, it's not going to happen, right? because there's something else that we need to talk about. 
at the top here, I'm going to give you some of my thinking on how I understand the world and the challenges. At the top block there, that pink block, is the factual matrix. The content. So what are some of the issues that we're dealing with within the South African space at the moment? Some of the issues, I'll start it off. Land, what else? What are some of the issues in the South African space? Fees must fall. Fees must fall, yeah. Adoption. Corruption. corruption. I was like, I haven't heard the adoption scandal yet. State capture. State capture. KPMG. White monopoly capital. Radical economic transformation. What about education? What about um, Zuma? What about Zilla? Hey? What's that? Water. Water. <laughs> right? All right. Thank you. So we all know the issues. We all know the issues, and they're many. That's the factual matrix, the content. And we love talking about these things. We will tune into the Eusebius MacKaiser show or SAFM and we'll have a whole in Bezo and land and we'll chat back and forth and fees must fall and white lovely capital and all these things. We'll chat, 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 chat. Why? Because this is safe. It's safe. It's academic. But we're missing a critical point. We're not talking about the emotional matrix. That sits underneath the factual matrix, which is the context. What do you here think today? are the two main emotions within the South African space today. Anger. Anger. Excellent. And? Fear. Anger and fear. We know these things. Anger and fear are the two dominant emotions within the South African space. And we refuse to talk about it. So you know what we do? This is what we do. We'll talk about land. But really, we're not talking about land. We're actually trying to use land as a proxy to talk about our anger and our fear. But we're not talking about our anger and our fear because we're trying to talk about land. So what are we talking about? Nothing. Nothing. So we try to talk about white monopoly capital, but we're not talking about white monopoly capital. We're actually trying to talk about our anger and our fear, but we're not talking about our anger and our fear. We're trying to talk about white monopoly capital, so we're talking about nothing. We, as South Africans, as human beings, have to forget about the content, the facts, the factual matrix, and start talking about our shared anger and fear. South Africans, let me tell you something. The work that I do is very important. It has to start opening up conversations around shared angers and fears. Because when I go into an exco meeting at a bank, and we're talking transformation, how can we not recognize the anger and fear that these white men hold when it comes to change. And the problem is, is we actually delegitimize their anger and fear. We say, why are you angry? Why are you scared? You've got nothing to be scared about. You're fine. You're going to be okay. And then we have a black female and we say, why are you angry? Why are you scared? You're fine. You're a black female. You're good. So we just delegitimize all the emotions. You know what it's kind of like? It's kind of like a headache. I have a headache and you have a headache. And you say, yo, Roy, I've got such a headache. And I'm like, oh, yeah, me too. And then he says, no, my headache's much worse than yours. <laughs> and I say, well, I think my headache's much worse than your headache. And you're like, no, mine's much. And we sit and we're going to argue about whose headache is worse than each other's. When really, we both have a headache. We're both in pain. So how do we sit and hold the space and say, you have a headache and I have a headache. I don't know how bad your headache is and you don't know how bad mine is, but we both have a headache. Once we can recognize that, surely we can come together and work on solutions as to how to resolve this headache that we have together. It is my belief, and if anyone has connections in any of these organizations, please do chat to me, that we can get AFRI Forum on the one side and Black First, Land First on the other side and we can have a conversation and even find resolution about land within South Africa when we actually start talking about the shared angers and fears that both of those organizations hold in a non-judgmental space, in the space that recognizes them and sees them and says, your headache is legitimate. My headache is legitimate. How do we work through this? Yes, sir. If you take away the anger and the fear, you are taking away the heart of politics. Ah, 
right? So a lot of the anger and the fear is actually used to drive certain agendas. Absolutely, but we know that that ends badly. So I'm not even, we shouldn't even be recognizing it. But the reason why I want to put this up here is because I want you to remember this always. When you listen to the radio, when you're having conversations with people, listen to the facts, that factual matrix, and then stop and say, ah, oh, ang- is there anger and fear underneath here that somebody's not talking about? And inevitably, you'll find it. And it's in those moments that we have to be really brave and say, let's talk about the anger and fear that you're holding. That's when we start creating the real conversations. And these are the conversations that we as South Africans absolutely need to have. Over here on the projector, she was my, my niece. Her name was Phoebe. And she lived in, uh, she lived in New Zealand with my o- elder brother. And uh, they came out to South Africa in November, December, and I met them for the first time. And she said to me, Roy, I'm a pansexual romantic homosexual. I'm a pansexual romantic homosexual. And I looked at him like, that's wonderful, and went to grew research what the hell that was. <laughs> I was like, what is this? Right? 13 years old. 13 years old. This is Leo, who two weeks ago, same person, this is Leo, who two weeks ago came out to my older brother as being transgender. So I've lost a niece, and I've gained a nephew. Now this scenario between Phoebe and Leo brings up so much, right? Brings up so much for all of us, and we don't have time to unpack it at all. Because it relates a lot to that diversity, things that I was talking about. But I could just hear my mom, who's a very devout Christian, in the back of my mind, because my mom doesn't yet know. We're going we're gonna to break it in slowly. Um, <laughs> I could just hear my mom in the back of my mind saying, you know, this new age, this new age thing of homosexuality and transgender, it's all rubbish, right? And I really want to caution everyone here because if you listen to what my mom says, there's an anger and fear behind that, right? And we have to deal with that anger and fear and where that comes from. This here, this 13-year-old who can say I'm a pansexual, romantic, homosexual and then have the bravery to come out as transgender, we're seeing more and more, not, listen carefully to me, not because it's new, but because there is a change of consciousness that is happening in our world, right? There is a change in consciousness. Nothing is new here. We now just have a change in consciousness. We, have, we now have social media, which allows us access to information and the courage to understand ourselves, and it's a beautiful thing. So we are seeing this rise in consciousness. Okay? For those of you who understand the laws of the universe, yin and yang vibes, okay? With the rise in consciousness comes the rise in fear. Okay? And we're seeing that with the alt-right, with Trump. Right? So we have this rise in consciousness, and what is there to balance it out? Fear. And that's what we're seeing. So we really have to be cognizant of the war that is happening behind the scenes. It's the war of consciousness and anger and fear. And we have to decide which side we sit on. And we'll oscillate. Sometimes we'll be in the consciousness space, sometimes in the fear space. As long as we are aware of that and can work through that, we're in a good space. Fees, roads must fall. Fees must fall. Pretoria girls. These are movements of consciousness, but you guys can see the fear that it brings up and the anger. Right? You only have to be on Facebook and listen to any radio station to hear the anger and the fear, but these are movements of consciousness. And it's incredible to watch, and it's a real honor to be a part of it in the time, and I, I even want you to kind of introspect now as to how you feel about these things. Because they are, they're movements of consciousness of change, but it cre- creates a lot of anger and fear that we have within us. Someone tell me, what is truth? What is truth? Melanie used the word truth, and I like the word. Someone tell me what it is. Come. Don't get too comfortable in your content, because everyone gets really contemplative at this point, and they start introspecting. Wonderful, you can do that on your drive home. What is truth? What is truth? Someone tell me. Come. Hey? What is truth? Hey? When you don't lie. When you don't lie. Oh. <laughs> What is hungry when you're not full? <laughs> Thank you. What is truth? Yeah. What is real to you? What is real to you? Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. What else? So there is no truth. Tell me more about this. Only perspectives. There's no such thing as truth, only perspectives. And you said what is true to you, right? That also sounds very subjective. It sounds very personal. But if we think of the word truth, truth is singular. Truth doesn't allow for a twin. There is one truth, right? So how can we say that truth is your perspective? 
because then we have 150 different truths within this room and my question to you is whose truth is more important than the other person's truth within this room here today You, do you want to come sit over here? Like. <laughs> that's the truth that's going to prevail. So the one in power. Okay. The one who is in power. Uh-huh. All right. There was a shaking head there when I said whose truth is more important. How can we determine? A lot of people say no one's truth is more important than the other person's truth. Everyone's truth is equally important. And yes, in the utopian world, that is where we want to go. But the truth, of the truth of the matter is, my truth is the most important because it's mine. It's what I believe. It's what I understand. It's how I make sense of this world. It's how I show up. So obviously mine is the most important. Obviously my headache is the worst. <laughs> and I'd like to challenge everyone here today because the way truth as a structure is set up is to believe that it is oneness, that it is absolute, and that anyone who doesn't share your truth is less true, less true, less true, less true, less true, most untrue, most untrue, completely false. And that's the devaluing that we do on a daily basis. So my mom, who's a devout Christian, would look at somebody who practices polygamy and say, that's very far away from my truth. And because my truth is absolute, that must be wrong. And we just kind of walk down this this road. When we see different color skins, we could say everyone's truth is equally important, right? But we don't. We don't do that. We kind of say this person's truth must be different to mine and because it's different from mine and there can only be one truth, they must be less true. I want to challenge everyone here today not to let go of your truth because your truth is who you are, it makes up who you are, but to understand that it's not a truth. It's just thoughts, beliefs and opinions that you hold. And it's only really important to you. No one else really cares about your truth, really. As a practice, what I'd say, if you are going to hold on to the word truth, then understand and respect that as obsessed as you are with your truth, so too should you be as obsessed with the other person's belief in their own truth. So not to agree with them, but to respect them for being as obsessed with their truth as you are with yours as a practice. Okay? So, I'm lying, actually, <laughs> speaking about truth, is that I believe that there is no such thing as truth, but then I also believe that there's this overarching or meta-truth by which our world is structured. Are you guys ready for a slide, a big slide? Are you guys ready for the slide? Okay. When I show you the slide, I want you to feel what comes up for you, all right? I mean, Melanie, when, when she was speaking, I, we can see we're both facilitators. The specific words that we use show up. What's coming up for you? I often want to do a little skit of facilitators at lunch. Right, exactly. So, as I show you the slide, I want you to kind of feel what's coming up for you. There is no judgment as to what comes up within that emotional context of yours. All of it is welcome within the space. Okay? Actually, maybe I'm hyping this up. Maybe this is quite boring. Let's see. <laughs> So I said that there's no such thing as truth, but then I said, no, there is actually this overarching or meta-truth by which our world is structured. And this overarching or meta-truth are the thoughts, beliefs, and opinions of white, straight men who are able-bodied, Christian, and English-speaking. <laughs> that there is this overarching or meta-truth by which our world is structured, and these are the thoughts, beliefs, and opinions of white, straight men who are able-bodied, Christian, and English-speaking. The way I've set it up in terms of plugs is really when I'm talking about truth, I'm talking about access to power. And really what I'm talking about when I say access to power and nobody freak out, I'm talking about privilege. And really, to remove all these words that trigger us, what I'm talking about when I say privilege is having a voice. So, for all of these plugs that you plug into, white, straight, man, able-bodied, Christian, English-speaking, and there are many, many more. For all of these that you plug into, you're going to find yourself having your voice automatically legitimized within a space. Automatically being seen. For all of these that you don't plug into, you're going to find yourself having to work extra hard to have your voice legitimized within a space. Okay, that's all we're saying. Now there's a critical point that I want to say here, and maybe this can deal with some of the emotions that are happening within the room now. Listen really carefully to this. We are not saying that this person is a bad person. We are not saying that if you plug into one or more or all of these, 
that you are a bad person, that you're the worst, that you're the problem with South Africa, that you're the reason why we're in this. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. Now, the default is to think that that's what I'm saying. Oh, great, another presentation of me being told that I'm the worst person, I'm the perpetrator. That's not what I'm saying. Why I put this up is an exercise in awareness. To understand that there are things at play, even within the South African space, that we don't yet understand. And it is this idea of how we allocate trust and who has a voice within a space. Yes, ma'am. It's for the world, yeah. At least the Western world, absolutely. Yeah. I even read somewhere the other day that anything that you can find on Wikipedia about Africa is written by 80% of white males in Europe. Yeah. Anything, all the facts that you can, well, the facts that you can find. So I was like, wow. Really yeah. yeah. What are some of the things which have come up with this, guys? Come. Now this is the point where you're saying, oh, Roy, now you had me and now I'm not interested in you anymore. <laughs> this is generally that point. What's coming up, if anything? Because a lot of, maybe I'll share some of the things which I usually get fed back. Roy, this isn't the case in South Africa because we have a black government. So what are you talking about access to power like we don't? Some of the things maybe you guys agree with? History. Our history? <coughs> this is kind of our history, yeah. Yeah, because however you choose to look at it, yeah. there is a black past. Yeah. Years. yeah. So, people's default mode when you talk about what is wrong now is, oh, but we only had 22 years. You see? So, it's that balance of even if I'm doing something wrong now, yeah. I'm still learning mm. because I didn't have that. And then on the other side, it is, yeah. we did it right. Look how you. <coughs> yeah, yeah. This brings up a lot, and I wish we had more time to unpack this, because this can go really deep, and I don't want to get too deep now, because it's not really safe for us to go all the way into this, and then we just have to end this conversation. That's not responsible as me. Yes? I just want to say, my husband fits into every one of those blocks, is blocks so you must know what a wonderful life I live. Yeah. <laughs> Buttons are being pushed, and I, and, I, and I accept that that's part of my journey. Yeah. You know, I married a colonizer. You know, yeah. that's the narrative, and so, so how do I show up in the world every day with this person that makes me feel unintentionally like that nine-year-old on the playground? Right, yeah. It's, a con it's, a, it's an exercise in consciousness and awareness as to how these things play out. I want to talk quickly about this here, white privilege, quickly, because I think it's, it's relevant just to debunk some of the, the mysteries around this. When we bring up white privilege and we talk about white privilege, listen carefully, everybody, to me now, please. We are not saying that you didn't work hard, that your grandparents didn't work hard, that your parents didn't work hard, that your great-grandparents didn't work hard. That's not what we're saying at all. We're not saying that you were given, or people, white people were given everything because you know, they were just white. Not at all. How we see privilege is this. You know that travelator at the airport when you come off the plane and you walk like this, but really you're moving like that. Right? You know that thing. That's what privilege is, right? So you're walking on the travelator, you're working hard, right? But the experience is that you can move much quicker. Why? Not because you didn't work hard. You're not lying on this travel aid and it's just moving you along. No, you're working. But the reason when we talk about white privilege, what we say is this, is that the hard work of our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our parents, and yourselves has been allowed to amount to something because of our history. We're not saying that you haven't worked hard and you've just been given everything because you're white. No, but what we are saying is that that hard work has been allowed to grow been allowed to accumulate where for people who didn't who weren't white that hard work was never allowed to accumulate that's it and it's such a simple concept but you know why we get frustrated is because we also never have the opportunity to talk about our anger and our fear even for white people to be seen as the perpetrator the entire time and we need to start having these conversations in a meaningful way where we can connect yes ma'am Be post-racial. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful question. And I want to talk quickly on white guilt. And, and this is a critical point. Is that I have done this before. I, I'll, I'll share a story with you just now. Um, 
White people, especially now in the South African space, we're dying to say, can we just get over apartheid? Can we just get over our past and just move forward and grow, right? And we need to be careful when we say things like this because we have nothing to get over. We've got nothing to move on from, really. You know, we've been here waiting, you know. And we don't have anything to get over. So to tell somebody to get over something is missing the historical issues. But how do we move past race, right? Or how do we deal with these feelings of white guilt? You know what I'd like to say in response to that? We first have to recognize that we hold a sense of privilege as a result of one or many of these things that we plug into. And then it's not about feeling guilty. What, it, what is it? It is about really how do we repurpose this privilege? So we'll never let go of your whiteness or your straightness or your masculinity. I mean, unless you're going through transition, really. But you're never going to let go of these things. So don't feel guilty about having it. But how do we repurpose that privilege? And that's the question. And repurposing your privilege doesn't mean selling your house and going to teach English in a township. In fact, that's absolutely not what we're talking about. <laughs> Quite the opposite. You know what it is for me? How do we create the space for other people at the table? That's, that's how we repurpose privilege. So what we say to a lot of the um, male execs within the space, when we say repurpose your privilege, understand that a woman, and particularly a woman in color within the boardroom, they don't have a voice like you have a voice. So understand that orientation, understand the space, and understand how you can open up space for somebody whose voice isn't. So that's the idea. Instead of feeling guilty, oh, I'm feeling so guilty, I'm white, and oh, I say, no, this is who I am. This is where I'm standing. I hold a sense of privilege and power within this position. No, no fault of my own. It is what it is. How do I open up the space to invite people in? That is what we need to do. So try work through those ideas of guilt. I think the South African narrative is anger and defense. And we saw critically with fees must fall, right? Those are the only two things we know, anger and defense. And I want us to move past this. How do we move past this? By recognizing that we are all racist. <laughs> That we are all sexist, that we are all homophobic, but not because we're bad people, but that's how we've been socialized. We are all racist. We are all, in fact, everyone say with me one, two, three, I am racist. One, two, three, I am racist. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> one, two, three, I am racist. Wonderful. How did that feel? <laughs> How did that feel? What, what, what is that feeling like? Hey? What is that feeling like? Why? Ah, uh, yeah. I, I always think, yeah. I always thought that your racism, your ism, yeah. is when you usurp your power over someone else. Mm. So if I don't usurp my colouredness over someone, then I don't believe I'm a racist. Uh -huh. So I didn't. Uh, say after you that I'm racist. Ah, because so you're not. I yeah. think I'm maybe a little bit classist. Okay. Or uh, something else's. Okay. But I'm not a racist. <laughs> <laughs> what, is the, what is the difference between racism, sexism, homophobia? They're all the same thing. No, but I was say, I thought your prejudice only comes yeah. when you think that you're better, you're better or, or you use your power yeah. of that concept of yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm not going to it because we all get to learn essentially. That right there that I've just drawn, if you can believe it or not, is an iceberg. Okay, <laughs> this is an iceberg. Here's the top of the iceberg, here's the bottom. Okay, we all seem to think that racism, sexism, and homophobia is discrimination. So using the K word or calling a woman, I hope none of these are trigger words, calling a woman a bitch or calling a gay man a faggot. We all think that that's all racism is. This top section, discrimination. And this is why we reject it. This is why we say, whoa, I'm not a racist. I got black friends. You know, <laughs> the classic line. You know, because we reject that part, the top part. I'm not racist. I don't do these awful things. But then there's this huge underbelly of the ism. And this is the social and the structural exclusion of difference that we buy into every day. So a classic example is when we drive past, we're driving behind somebody who's driving badly, and when we drive past, we just look to see if it's a woman. We're like, mm, yeah. Right. So it's essentially, it's essentially that. So we don't, we're not, you know, we're not saying, you bitch, get off the road, you know. I was like, yeah, thought so. Okay? Pardon? Right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. I guess so. So my thing is this. Why I want to do that exercise with you is because if we can all just sit and hold that and say, yeah, we are all these things. Not because we're bad people, but because how we've been socialized. And now I'm not saying that you're going to say, oh, well, I've been socialized like this, I'm just going to continue. No. <laughs> but that we can, because people want to do that. Right? Like, oh, I'm sexist, it's my fault about how I've been socialized. No. It's having that awareness. It's having that awareness and that connection. And then understanding how we unlearn these learned behaviors. Okay? Let's move on. This is transformation. How far do you think we've come as a South African society from where we were to where we want to be? I want you to plot for yourselves how far you think we've come as a nation from where we were to where we want to be. Just plot for yourself now. And I'm not talking about June 2010 in the World Cup when we were all here, right? Just plot for yourself. How far we've come as a nation, from where we were to where we want to be. We'll come back to this. Are you saying we moved back from June 2010? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you guys, but June 2010 was probably the best month of my life. <laughs> like, 95 as well, yeah. Right, we just felt this connectedness and we were like, yes, we're together, we're doing this, right? It was a really wonderful feeling. But now, where we are at the moment, just plot for yourself. I'm going to start moving quite quickly, because we've got lots to get through. What is equality? Someone tell me, without me having to beg. What is equality? I know it's hot in here and the, hot, the heat really does sometimes be struggling to keep awake. I understand that. What is equality? Come, what is equality? It's a fundamental pillar of our constitution. What is it? Everyone's treated equally. Equally. So if I earn 400 rand a month and you earn 400 million rand a month, must we pay the same percentage of tax? So then, is our Income Tax Act unconstitutional because it violates the equality provision? Yes. So why haven't we taken it to court? Because that's not what equality is. Listen carefully. These are, we, we're busting assumptions here today. Equality is not sameness. It is not treating everyone equally. That is not what equality is. We like to, we get fed this, that equality is actually treating everyone equally. It is not. So Roy, what is true equality? True equality is treating different people differently. True equality is treating different people differently. Now that is a huge step from where we went to think that equality is sameness and equal treatment. It's not. Here is a picture for you that sums up the point beautifully. On the left is what we think equality is. Treat everyone equally. Treat everyone equally. Fairness, you know. On the right is what true equality is. And that is treating different people differently in order to have access to equal opportunity. That is what true equality is. Now this was, this blew my mind when I first had to unpack what this meant because for me, Affirmative action and BEE was always apartheid in reverse and reverse racism, right? And it created a lot of anger and fear within myself. As a young adult, just to share some of my stories, a young boy, as a young man, I was incredibly anxious because my dad said to me my whole life, there's no opportunity for you in this country. You need to get out. You're a white man. There's no opportunity for you here. A lot of anger, a lot of fear, and a lot of frustration. And only at age 23 when I studied constitutional law and I was engaging with equality and I was being challenged and saying, whoa, actually, I'm learning something which is very different to what I believed. And I realized that I had all the inherited perceptions of my parents. That I believed everything that they did without me even knowing it. It was just there. And I had to then work really hard to uproot some of these inherited perceptions. And that change for me was so liberating. I said to Melanie earlier, I think, that that was the first day that I actually became a South African citizen, when I actually said, no, there's a spot for me within this place. There is a, there's a huge responsibility that I have within this country, and I have an opportunity and I need to use it. And that opportunity, what the calling for me was, was to go into schools within the Western Cape and to talk about this. Now, I told the teachers in life orientation that I was doing human rights and constitutional literacy. I wasn't, okay? I was really coming in and saying, your parents are lying to you, right? They've lied. This is all a sham. There's so much for us to do, but we need to start having the self-awareness. Let's start engaging, right? And I've continued to do that work ever since. 
Because I believe in the power of change. I believe that people can change. Why do I believe it so much? Because I have changed. And if I can do it, I'm pretty sure everyone else can. You guys can hear somebody ask me in the little meet and greet, where are you from? And what I really wanted to say, I'm not sure. Yes, really what I wanted to say was private school. <laughs> you know, <laughs> private school. Um, but I can, I can believe, like, I, I believe in that change because there's been so much that I have had to undo and it's possible and I want to try to find the formula to do that and this is the best way to do it, to actually have honest conversations in a non-judgmental space that somebody can say, you know what Roy, I don't agree with you. I don't be and we can actually have a conversation where somebody can say, you know, I'm really scared when we talk about transgender. It really makes me scared because I feel like it's an abomination that gay men are disgusting. Why can't somebody say that? Why can't we hold and love that person? You know how difficult that is, as a gay man myself, to hold that and say, all right, that's your truth. How do we now acknowledge each other's headaches and move us through that space? That is the superhuman strength that we need within the space. And I'm not saying we do it all the time, but it's a skill that we need to start developing. And that skill is self-awareness and self-orientation. Self-awareness to know yourself, right? To understand yourself and self-orientation. How do I exist within a context that is greater than me? Yes. Back to that this one here. Uh, there is a sense of concern. Okay. Okay. We look at the X and the Y. Oh, uh, the, the slide here. The one before this, okay. The in terms of policy. Yes. We're at 100%. Yes. The best policies in the world. The best constitution. Look at this document here. This is the one. Yeah. So, then we go back to the next slide. Yeah. One of the people. It yeah. Yeah. Now to say something like treat different people differently yeah. without unpacking what we mean by that takes us back. If, if you look at if you look at people who are not as open minded as you'd like to think they are. Yeah. Okay? So you go back to this hegemony. Yeah. And I'm reading an amazing book at the moment, The Help. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell you it's so emotional. Mm. Every evening it's not a drama. Mm. Because they treat different Shh. people. Okay, this is a great point. What do I mean by different treatment? If we have two stairways going into a building and we say we need to put a ramp. So we're going to take one of the stairs away and put a ramp. And all the people who are able bodied are going to say, You're treating us this is so unfair. You're taking away one of our stairs and you are treating people in wheelchairs much better than we are. Is there truth in that? Is there truth in that? Different treatment is not better treatment. Different treatment is different treatment. This is the critical thing. So a lot of the frustration that happens within the South African space in, in the white context, because that's where I come from, is we say, we're 23 years into our democracy now. Everyone's equal, born freeze, right? Why do we have these policies that discriminate against the... De but we only say that because we actually don't understand the legacy of our past. We like to forget about it, right? So what happened after 1994, guys? What do you think happened? We said, that was hectic. Close that chapter, put it in a library, and maybe burn the library, right? Let's never talk about this again. Let's not talk about it. And then 23 years later, now 2017, we think that we can have conversations with one another. We are children trying to have a debate. We've never been given the language and the tools to create and to connect cross-culturally, right? So we'd think different. Oh, you're treating us differently because we've never actually understood the historical legacies. Fees Must Fall is a critical example. I'll show you that this is the contradiction which I heard throughout Fees Must Fall, or Roads Must Fall actually. Look at UCT, right there on the mountain. It was the legacy of Rhodes that built this amazing institution, right? We recognize good legacies. And then in the same breath, we'll say, we're 23 years into South Africa. We need to get over apartheid. We'll never recognize the longevity of bad legacies. Good legacies, we understand. It has a rolling effect and it passes on and it grows. Bad legacies, we don't think. Here is the take home line. Much like advantage is inherited, so too is disadvantage. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Much like advantage is inherited, so too is disadvantage. And we recognize the advantages that we inherit, but we're very quick to dismiss the disadvantage that we inherit because it requires a self-reflection. It, it brings up a sense of guilt. And I say, let's recognize that disadvantage is inherited, that a black 
counterpart of mine, even if they went to a private school, their dad may not have been able to help them with maths like mine did. Because their dad probably didn't go to the school that my dad did. Not because my dad worked harder or was better, but because he was white. So m this counterpart of mine, who even went to bishops or whatever, this, these fancy schools, they are still carrying a sense of disadvantage. Right? And there's not, there's not about, it's not about being shameful. It's about being honest. Right? And they're saying, okay, let's recognize what's up. And how do we now move through it? Right? So I kind of already cheated, but who put us over there? <coughs> in terms of how far we've come from where we were to where we want to be. Who put us over here? Yeah. I've done this presentation for grade eights, all the way to matrix, all the way to CEOs of big corporates. And without fail, people put us there because we don't feel like we're moving in the right direction. Sometimes we feel like we've stalled or we're in reverse. Who's driving the bus? Who's driving this bus? Right? We don't know. I have to finish up anyway, and then we will... Um, We'll have a bit of a question and answer session because I don't really like talking, even though it doesn't seem like it. <laughs> it doesn't look like I want to talk too much. Here's the call to action. Listen carefully. This is the preamble of this constitution, this document of ours. I don't know if anyone's read it. But listen carefully because we're going to have a little Q&A afterwards. Listen carefully. And listen really to the emotional language that comes up for you. Right, ready. We, the people of South Africa, we recognize the injustices of our past. We honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land. We respect those who have worked to build and develop our country. And we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our freely elected representatives, adopt this constitution so that we may help heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice and fundamental human rights. That we may lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. That we may improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. And that we may help build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations. How do we feel? What came up for you from an emotional perspective? Hey, what came up for you? For you? Um, very good. Beautiful, hey? Beautiful. And then we turn on our radios. So a sense of cynicism yes. and a sense of inspiration. Right, right. Who's, it sounds so beautiful. Who's doing this? So we have this, wonderful, we have this spectrum of inspired and all the way down to completely cynical. I'm going to make one change. I'll come to you now. I'm going to make one change to the reading of this preamble. Listen carefully. I, a citizen of South Africa, I will recognize the injustices of our past. I will honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land. I respect those who have worked to build and develop our country. And I believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. I, therefore, through our freely elected representatives, adopt this constitution so that I may help heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. That I may lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. That I may improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person and that I may help build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations. That one change... <laughs> yeah, right? But that one change, the change in that pronoun from we to I, and the spectrum of inspired and cynicism disintegrates. Because then it's not them. Whoever them is. Then it's us. Then it's me. Saying, shit, what am I doing? And the call to action is not to, quit, like I said, quit your job and get a nose ring and, you know. That's an, I mean, if you want to do that, that's <laughs> very sore. But the call to action is not to just let go of all our lives, right? But it's really that we can be self-reflexive and interrogate our own selves and our own position. That we can create space for the people around us in order to create the growth that we want within the space. Schools are my passion project because you guys are primed to creating the future of this country. 
but we need to start redefining what the class of the future looks like. The class of the future, the missing link that I tried to fill in was the fact that we do not have social education within the South African space. And I really urge all of the teachers here today to start having tough conversations. But the first way you can do it is really to understand yourself within your space. Okay. Um, I'm over time and let's open up and have if there are any questions. I can feel it's so hot and I can feel the energy is being drained from me. Whenever I feel the energy being sucked out, I have to give more to keep people awake. So I'm going to pass out in the next 15. Any questions on this? Thank you so much for, for being attentive and for listening. Um, yeah, let's, let's take some questions in terms of some of these tough things. And I'd really ask you to be brave at this point. Any questions? Nothing. Mine was a comment. I wanted to say, do you think our take of our country is at the moment is influenced by our own experiences? So what do you mean by that? I, you, you may say that maybe as a country that's where we are, but I may say no, we're actually not going yeah, to yeah, going. Yeah, everyone is going to have a different point based on their own understanding. My point changes on a daily basis. I'll t read News 24, open up Facebook, and I'm like, oh, we're here. You know, so it oscillates and changes all the time. I think there's just a feeling of not being good, you know? Yes, sir. Can I ask maybe what um, advice would you give to teachers? Yeah. How to, how to influence this uh, phenomenon that you're talking about? Yeah. So the question is, how as teachers do we influence this and create this? Here's my answer. Forget about trying to teach inclusion and transformation as an end point. Start seeing inclusion and transformation as a skill set, which means you guys don't need to know the answers. Hmm. You don't need to know the answers. You just have to teach the skills. And here are the two skills. Number one, self-awareness, the ability to reflect. And number two, self-orientation, understanding the context so how do we teach our youth to be critical thinkers, to engage internally with their emotions, to unpack something and to recognize their biases in a space that we can actually hold? Teachers do not need to know how to do this as an end point. We just have to start creating a space where we can have tough conversations. So that's what I would say. Let's actually utilize life orientation in a meaningful way. Right? Let's start talking about race, for goodness sakes. Let's do it. Okay, everyone's good. Thank you. I'll be here and we can chat afterwards. Thank you so much for your time here today.